Hello and welcome to my latest video. So this time we're going to be taking the first of quite a few looks through uh, the original Asterix novels. Now um, I've got the first three original books for us to review today and uh, well it's just been an absolute nostalgic trip. Um, so I've sort of researched a little bit more about the artist and writer because I didn't know a massive amount about uh, Goscinny and Uderzo and how the uh, comic strip came to be and uh, it's just a fascinating story. Um, I've also recently bought the, the first three novels in these really nice um, hardback editions and they are so beautiful to read in that format. Um, so we'll be having a look at those as well because I believe this is the best possible way to read these books today. Um, but they're full of nostalgia. We'll go through all the plot lines, the stories, the origins, interesting things that I've found along the way. And uh, well, I hope you're going to enjoy it. So sit back, relax, and let's get to it. So we'll start off with a brief introduction to the series. René Cassini was born in 1926 and Albert Uderzo in 1927. Cassini was a French comic editor and writer who created the Asterix comic book series alongside Albert Uderzo, who was the illustrator. In 1959, the Edie France Edie Press Syndicate started the Franco-Belgian comics magazine Pilot. Corsini became one of the most productive writers for the magazine, and in the magazine's first issue, he launched Asterix, with Uderzo as artistic director. Now, we'll look at the career and life of both these creators in much more detail in a future video, but for now, let's just concentrate on the first few stories. So the original Asterix the Ghoul then was first published as a serial in Pilo magazine, the Franco-Belgian comics magazine that was founded by Corsini and a few other comic artists. The first page appeared in a promotional issue zero, which was distributed on the 1st of June 1959. And the story was then serially published in the magazine from issue number one, which was published on the 29th of October 1959, and lasted until issue 38, which was published on the 14th of July 1960. A small illustrated head of Asterix first appeared on the cover of issue number nine, that was the 24th of December 1959, and a full colour Asterix cover was used on issue number 21, which was dated the 17th of March 1960. The next story, which was Asterix and the Golden Sickle, started in issue 42, which was published on the 11th of August 1960. Now, the first collected edition, which was an early graphic novel of sorts, Asterix Le Gouard, was published in July 1961 by Dargold in the so-called Pilo Collection, with a print run of just 6,000 copies. A Dutch translation followed in 1966, and other languages followed soon after. The English translation by Anthea Bell and Derek Hockridge was first published in 1969 by Brockhampton Press, which was part of the Little Hampton Books Group. The plate for page 35 was redrawn by Alberto Derzo's brother Marcel in 1970 because the original was lost. This is why there are some slight differences in the drawing style. All English versions from Hodder and Stoughton, that's Hodder Dargord, used the original illustrations which were made from a copy of an actual printed page, hence the blurriness. The 2004 releases from Orion Books, which is what we've got here, uses the redone illustrations from the French editions. The story is as follows. All of the Gaul area is under Roman control, except for one small village in Amorica, which is present-day Brittany, whose inhabitants are made invincible by a magic potion created periodically by the druid Getafix. To discover the secret of the Gaul's strength, Centurion, Christmas Bonus, commander of a Roman garrison at the fortified camp of Compendium, sends a spy disguised as a Gaul into the village. The Roman's identity is revealed when he loses his false moustache, shortly after he discovers the existence of the magic potion, whereupon he reports his, his discovery to the centurion. Christmas Bonus, hoping to overthrow Julius Caesar, orders Getafix captured and interrogated for the recipe, but to no avail. Protagonist Asterix learns of Getafix's capture from a cart seller. He infiltrates the Roman camp in the latter's car and hears Christmas Bonus revealing his intended rebellion to Marcus Ginantonicus, his second in command. Following Asterix's suggestion, 
Getafex pretends to agree to the Centurion's demands of the potion, while Asterix pretends to give in to torture and demands an unseason seasonal ingredient, strawberries. While Christmas Bonus's soldiers try to find the strawberries, Asterix and Getafix relax in relative luxury, and when the strawberries arrive, consume them all and console Christmas Bonus that the potion may be made without them. After all the ingredients are found, a potion is prepared that causes the hair and beard of the drinker to grow at an accelerated pace. The Romans are tricked into drinking this potion, and before long, all of them have long hair and beards. When Christmas Bonus pleads Getafix to make an antidote, the druid makes a cauldron of vegetable soup, knowing that the hair growth potion shall soon cease to take effect, and also prepares a small quantity of the real magic potion for Asterix. As Getafix and Asterix escape, they are stopped by a huge army of Roman reinforcements, commanded by Julius Caesar. Upon meeting Asterix and Getafix, Caesar hears of Christmas Bonus's intentions against himself. He deports Christmas Bonus and his garrison to Outer Mongolia and frees Asterix and Getafix for giving him the information, while reminding them that they are still enemies. The two Gauls then return to their village, where their neighbours celebrate their recovery. So this was the one that started it all, and uh, I certainly remember first coming across Asterix in uh, in my local library, I think, and, and then reading this particular story multiple times. Um, over the years, I do remember owning this and most of the Asterix books in the much smaller compact editions. Um, now, with my slightly older eyes, I sort of really prefer them in full-size editions, and these hardbacks are truly gorgeous. Um, it brought back so many memories. It was just fantastic. And the story, I think in particular, is a really great introduction to the series with a simple but a fun plot. Uh, Rereading this now, I could picture vividly what was coming up next, uh, even before I turned the page, which was uh, just fantastic. So there was a little bit of trivia associated with this particular story. So because it was the first album, many of the story points and the characteristics of the characters are still in their formative stages. So in fact, due to its um, original serial nature, where they only released a few pages each week, some characters actually develop and change even as the story progresses. For example, Getafix begins the story living in a cave in the forest and looking much more like a stereotypical caveman. Um, he's also seen using uh, a walking stick. Obelix is seen carrying an axe in his first appearance, which is obviously never seen again. Um, he is satisfied with helping Asterix eat just one boar between them, rather than have him one or more to himself. Um, Obelix is also only a peripheral character in this first album. He doesn't truly become Asterix's sidekick until the next album. He is also seen carrying much larger amounts of rock than in later issues. Fully Automatics is seen working metal with his bare hands. He also bears no resemblance to his later appearances. Cacophonics, the bard, plays and calls a dance, and at the end is seated at the table at the feast with all the, all the other villagers. At later albums established the running gag where he is never allowed to sing, except in Asterix and the Normans, the Mansions of the Gods, and Asterix and the Magic Carpet, and is tied up and gagged at feasts to prevent this. When he is first introduced in the prologue, Caesar has a completely different look than, than he has in the rest of the series, including at the very end of the album. So now we'll take a look at the, the second book in the series, which is Asterix and the Golden Sickle. Disaster strikes the Gaulish village when Getafix the Druid breaks his golden sickle, as without one he cannot attend the annual conference of Druids or cut mistletoe for the magic potion which keeps the Roman army at bay. Asterix and Oblix set out for Luisha, which is present-day Paris, to buy a new sickle from Oblix's distant cousin, the sicklesmith Metallurgix. On the way there, they encounter bandits, but easily defeat them and learn from a fellow traveller that sickles are in short supply in Luisha. In the city, they find Metallurgix missing and make inquiries at a local inn, but the landlord professes to know nothing. He later gives a description of Asterix and Oblix to the devious Clover Garlix, who in turn directs them to his superior, Navistrix, who tries to sell them a sickle at an exorbitant price. They refuse and defeat Navistrix and his followers, only to be arrested by a Roman patrol. They are released by the prefect of Luisha, surplus dairy produce, and learn from a centurion that metallurgics may have been kidnapped by sickle traffickers. 
From a drunkard imprisoned by dairy produce, they learn that an avistrix has a hideout at a portal dolmen in the Boulogne forest. In the Vistrix underground storeroom, Asterix and Oblix find a horde of golden sickles, but are attacked by clover garlics, Navistrix and their minions. Upon defeat, Navistrix escapes, and Asterix and Oblix follow him to Surplus Dairy Produce, who, in front of the Centurion, freely confesses to have sponsored the illegal sickle monopoly for his own amusement. The Centurion releases Metallurgix and imprisons Dairy Produce and Navistrix, whereupon Metallurgix gratefully gives Asterix and Oblix the best of his sickles. With this, they return to their village and celebrate their achievement. So a pretty straightforward plot, this one, but I was grateful for the main characters to get out of the village to journey and then explore what would later become Paris. I found the artwork is far more refined in this volume. The printing is sharper and the artwork far more precise and detailed. It really feels like you're heading off on an adventure with Asterix and Oblix when they set off for Luisha. Perhaps not quite as amusing as the first story, but still great fun. Now, there were also a few points of interest in this one. So the world weary prefect of Luisha is a caricature of the actor Charles Lawton, who was known for playing Roman statesmen. Fans have also noted that due to an apparent error by Uderzo, the final pages from pages 36 onwards are drawn with smaller panels in like a comic strip format, resulting in much larger margins on those pages in the printed book. Now, this is the case in my um, earlier editions, but in the later 2004 ones that we've got here, that error has actually been corrected, which is good news. Um, the great ox cart race, the Sundinium 24 Hours, is a reference to France's 24 Hours of Le Mans sports car race. And Sundinium is the old name of Le Mans. Uh, one of the competitors in the race is a caricature of French cartoonist Jean Gratin. So that was book two. So book three is Asterix and the Goths. So... Asterix and Oblix, nervous about Getafix traveling alone to the annual Druids conference in the forest of the Carnutes, accompany him on his journey and remain outside the forest during the conference. Meanwhile, on the Roman Empire's border, two legionnaires are captured by a band of Goths, Tataric, Esistoric, Atmospheric, Prehistoric and Chloric, intending to kidnap the Druid of the Year and use his skills to conquer Gaul and Rome. En route to the forest, Asterix, Oblix and Getafix meet another druid, value-added tax, who uses his magical powers to convince the Romans to let them pass. At the edge of the forest of the Carnutes, Getafix and his friend leave Asterix and Oblix for the druid's conference. Unaware that the goth band is hiding nearby, the druids enter their inventions in a contest in which Getafix wins the Golden Menher Prize for his potion, which gives superhuman strength. As he leaves his colleagues, the Goths take him prisoner. Asterix and Oblix, fearing for their friend's safety after they do not see him leave the forest, enter the woods and find a Visigoth helmet. This is actually a, a pickle hole like those worn by the Germans during the, the first years of World War I. They instantly set out towards the east, thoroughly confusing Oblix to rescue Getafix. Unfortunately, they run into another Roman patrol, which spots the helmet Asterix is carrying and mistakes them for Goths, who are wanted for assaulting Roman border guards. Oblix and Asterix easily defeat the Romans, but the Roman general is informed of the incident and sends out pictures of Asterix and Oblix with a reward for their capture. Asterix has the bright idea of disguising himself and Oblix as Romans and ambushing two legionnaires, stealing their armour and weapons and leaving them tied up and gagged. Two other legionnaires, searching for the Goths, come across our heroes, in which Oblix's laughter at what they sh should say if they meet other Romans almost blows his and Asterix's cover. Soon after, the two legionnaires spot the two tied up Romans and mistake them for Asterix and Oblix, a fat one and a little one. Thinking another legionnaire 
captured them and has gone for reinforcements, they decide to take the reward and take the prisoners to the general's tent. When the captives are ungagged, however, the full story comes out and the Romans promptly begin capturing each other left and right, believing each other to be Goths, much to the disappointment of the general. Asterix and Obelix, back in Gaulish clothing, are completely untouched along with the Goths who approach the border. The Goths cross the Roman Empire's border back into Germania. They present the Druid first to a customs officer who at first refuses to let them through on charges of importing foreign goods. Eventually, the Goths present Getafix to their Gothic chieftain, Metric, calls in a Gothic Gaulish translator, Rhetoric, who is threatened to be executed if he does not convince Getafix to cooperate and brew the magic potion. Although Getafix flatly refuses, Rhetoric lies and says that he has agreed to do so in a week's time at the new moon. Meanwhile, Asterix and Obelix, Obelix also enter the Gothic lands. While running into a Gothic border patrol, Obelix stupidly uses the cover-up names he and Asterix used for their Roman disguises, making the patrol think that the Gauls are Romans. After Asterix and Obelix beat up the patrol, they disguise themselves as Goths by attacking two of them, infiltrating their barracks as members of their army. They escape from the Gothic army, but are soon captured again by the Goths and thrown in jail along with Rhetoric, who was also trying to flee. Although they are thrown in prison, Obelix easily breaks the door and they flee, taking Rhetoric with them to question. While at first he pretends to speak only Gothic, Rhetoric accidentally reveals that he can speak Gaulish and is forced to spill the beans. While trying to sneak into the Gothic town, Rhetoric screams and attracts a patrol. Although Asterix and Obelix beat up the patrol, they surrender to the last standing man to be brought to the chief. The Gauls are brought before Metrix. Getafix reveals that he can actually speak Gothic and informs Metric that Rhetoric had been deceiving them. Once again, Rhetoric is thrown in jail with the Gauls and they are all sentenced to execution. Asterix, Obelix and Getavix devise a scheme in which many Goths are given magic potion. So they spend time and energy fighting each other for chieftainship instead of invading Gaul and Rome, making Rhetoric play a part in it. Under the pretext of cooking a last Gaulish soup, Getafix gives the jailer a list of ingredients and brews the potion when he acquires them. During the public execution, Rhetoric asks to go first. Full of magic potion, he resists all attempts at torture and beats up Metric, throwing him, him in jail and making himself chieftain of the Goths. The Gauls visit Metric in his prison and give him magic potion. As the two chieftains have the same magic potion in them, a direct fight proves futile and each storms off, promising to raise an army. The Gauls wander around the town, giving potion to any Goth who looks browbeaten and who is glad of a chance of power. Their first two candidates being Electric, who is poor and has to, be, has to sweep up the streets, and Euphoric, who is being bossed about by his dictator-like wife. The would-be chieftains each raise an army, and a confusing set of conflicts begins, known as the Asterixian Wars, thus successfully sowing so much discord in Germania that the tribes are more occupied with fighting each other rather than trying to invade their countries. Although their peacekeeping mission probably created more casualties than a Gothic invasion of Rome would, the three Gauls make it back to Gaul, again running into the overeager young legionary at the border, return home confident and are welcomed with open arms by the village, who throw their usual banquet in celebration. So a few points of interest in this story then. So the story was made barely 18 years after World War II, and it is notable for its very anti-German tone, where the Goths are depicted as villainous characters. Elber Uderzo later expressed regret over the germophobic tone and in later Asterix stories like Asterix the Legionary, Germans are portrayed as more sympathetic characters. Asterix and the Goths was translated in West Germany at the time, but the translators had added political propaganda against East Germany without Gossini and Uderzo's knowledge. When the Asterix creators found this out, they immediately demanded that these elements be removed. I didn't really see much evidence of this. However, with the German race 
being just sort of like the bad guys in this story. I was, however, slightly surprised to spot a familiar looking swastika, though in a, in a German speech bubble, which is still evident in the 2004 edition. Now, I did feel that this story was definitely overly complicated for me and took the edge off the enjoyment of what was visually the best looking story so far. Um, it was good to see all the other druids wearing their golden sickles, as this was chronologically the next story after Asterix and the Golden Sickle. Now, these UK hardbacks, which we got here, were first published in 2004 and are still in print today. And I feel that they are an excellent way to read each story. Uh, the books are handily numbered on the spines, although I remember seeing the other titles listed on the back of uh, my earlier editions. And um, there are also larger omnibus editions, which themselves were initially published in hardback. However, these have started going out of print and are commanding big money on the second hand market. Number one sells for over £100 now. The omnibus editions contain three stories each and are thankfully still available to buy in paperback. And these are by far the cheapest way to enjoy the stories in order, in full size, when buying them brand new. Second hand, they are very, very cheap and plentiful, but finding nice condition copies is a bit tough as they are often read and reread multiple times. To be honest, eBay is the place to go to find bulk lots. Links to all the books are contained in the description down below. So there you go. Hope you enjoyed that little look through the first three Asterix books. They certainly are a lot of fun. Now, if you have enjoyed today's video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Do please consider subscribing if you've not already for regular vintage comic content. Um, I am going to do more Asterix videos. I do books four to six in my next one. And I am also starting the Tintins as well in a similar hardback format. So look out for that one in the future. Thank you very much for watching today. And I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Bye.